Okay. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our Jerome resident, Jelani Ellis, who is a, who is, who is a paper maker, <laughs> exploring, um, exploring paper making and textural paper, and um, got her um, degree at Virginia Commonwealth um, University before moving to Minneapolis. Um, you can come on up, Jelani, and we will stop this share. I didn't say it. I thought it was so, um, to the cloud. Maybe you didn't. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Did you charge it? So it's like it's a. You got to double jump. I don't know. How do people see the screen? People see this through her screen sharing description. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Jelani. Um, let's see, what should I say about myself? I was born in Maryland, raised in Virginia, and then I moved here after graduating during the pandemic because graduating into the pandemic, I was, I felt very like listless and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I didn't really have a portfolio that reflected, I wanted to be an animator at the time. And I didn't have a portfolio that reflected that. And then I heard that you had to go all the way to California to become an animator. And I think there were also a lot of animators striking at that time. So everything was just kind of in flux. And I think I was kind of scared to really make any moves. So my good friend, Margaret, uh, was like, well, I'm sad too. Let's move here. Let's be sad together. And I was like, no, that's crazy. Like, I don't want to do that. That's too crazy. And then I ended up moving over here. And it's been really great. I like the art scene here and I've met some really cool people. Um, I've become a public functionary resident in Studio 400, which is a really great community to be a part of. And I'm really feeling like I'm starting to come into my practice, which has really changed from the character design, storytelling, animator thing that I wanted to get into. So I'll talk more about that now. Um, this is some of the first paper that I've made. I made it during the pandemic as a pandemic hobby. I think I ended up doing kind of a lot of things because I was trying to reconnect with like a creative spark. I had like that art school burnout where I really did not have the drive to do anything for that first probably like year after I graduated. So I learned that you could make paper and I was like, just out of like, whatever, that's crazy. So that the gray paper is made out of, I stole a bunch of newspapers from those newspaper kiosks that are on the sidewalks. Cause I was like, nobody uses these, I can take them. <clears throat> so I did. And then the brown paper is made out of recycled brown paper shopping bags. And I guess the process of making paper is you take any material that is fibrous you pulverize it and you suspend it in water and then you can get a screen and then a frame to help the paper keep its shape and you pull that up through the water and then the fibers entangle and as that dries the fibers further like shrink and entangle themselves and then you get a sheet of paper and that blew my mind because the pulp is like this nasty paste and it's very fall apart-ish and then as soon as it dries you have like a solid sheet of paper so I was really fascinated by that um, this is a really bad picture that I took on my phone, but I wanted to show it because I made this. I went to, um, 
like a Lozone bone. I got a little handsaw and I used my roommate's miter's box and I was just like in the living room, like sawing this up. <laughs> I used my staple gun. This is some chicken wire and some window screen that I used to make the decal. And then I put the water in like those storage tubs and then I would flip it onto a bath towel, a couple bath towels layered on top of each other. And then the sheet that you saw in the last slide, I used this to absorb some of the water for a long while. So I was really into the DIY ability of maker, paper making. I think that's a big part of what gets me into art is the accessibility of it. And also the excitement of taking random junk and turning it into something that's really cool. Um, so when I first started making paper, I started like by drawing on it and printing on it, which I thought was cool, but I wanted to do a little more than that because I didn't want to make like a substitute for any paper that I could get just from like the store. So I ended up doing this kind of, I'm going to call it collage work, but if you take like string and other paper, and then these are cotton fibers that I got from a cotton ball from a bag that I had under my bed. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to get into makeup. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, this is too hard. I'm, <laughs> I'm scared. I'm going to stop. But if you press that into the wet pulp, it really adheres to itself, which I thought was really, really fun and exciting. I don't know why. I just really am into how paper pulp acts. This is me expanding on the printmaking and the collage work and trying to really find like a voice in it, I believe. So this is a linoleum print that I had made just randomly one time and then some letter stamps that I had. So I wanted to see what I can make out of that. Um, in the middle, you can just, I put it in like my inkjet printer and printed some Phoenix clip art that I'd found on Google just to see if I could. And then I ended up making that into a frame and then framing a print that I had made on another sheet of paper. And then with this one, I cut out little peepholes and then pasted paper of different colors on the back. So I was really having fun with this process. And then out of this came these two, these are my darling babies who I love. The one on the right, I was so like delighted by her. And I really, I just can't explain it. I don't know if it's because it's a crow and crows are really cool or if it's like the, the, the contrast of the different textures and like the crazy chaos of all the ka 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 that's going on in the frame around it. And then just the crow and this very chill, I think that was like the cleanest, least printed on junk mail that I could find that I made into a different sheet of paper. And then with this one, I ended up making a collage out of, also out of paper that I made. Um, I wanna say these were like newsprints and you can see here, there's some cotton fibers in there. And then these little tufts, I really realized you could unroll the cotton balls and then like trim them to make kind of like these furry accents. And both of these were bought and I think of them often. So whoever bought them, I hope you're taking good care of them. And I think this is where my practice really started to kind of evolve to be more focused on the pulp. And uh, I think it's really funny because I think it originated from messing up because I was like, oh, I want bigger paper. I found this frame, I think, um, I think there was originally a canvas on it, which is why it's got these in the middle. I think for people who don't know how paper making works, generally you have two separate pieces to pull the paper. There's the decal, which is just a flat sheet with a screen on it, and then the mold, which hold, hold, helps it keep its shape. When you kind of combine both of those, it's a little harder to get the paper out of it because it will stick. But I was trying to pour pulpy water in there because I didn't have a vat large enough for this deckle. And it was like leaving holes where I was pouring the water. And I was like, okay, well, let's just see where it goes. Let me just play with that a little bit. And I started like pinching up the pulp and it really did hold its shape on its own. So I was like, okay, so you can like sculpt with this. Like paper pulp is a sculptable material. It doesn't have to lay flat. So I started messing with the little swirls and then I ended up pouring blue pulp over that. So that became kind of like, almost like an illustration with paper pulp. And then with the other pieces, those are just the impressions of my fingers. And this is what those two pieces look like now that they're dry and not mounted on the mold in the decal. 
let's see. And then from there, I started sculpting with it more intentionally, where I used two, oh, should I admit him? Yes. Come on in, Corey. No problem. Uh, there we go. And then from there, I ended up sculpting a little bit more intentionally. I used two different paper pulps. I think one is just yellow office documents that I asked my work to give me instead of recycle. And then the other one is more brown paper shopping bags. And I had the two little buckets and then a palette knife. And I just like alternated the laying them down. And then with this one, I poured some blue paper pulp onto a decal. And I put some cotton fibers in there, which might be hard to see through the presentation, but there's like little swirls of white. And I wanted, I in my brain, I needed something to help support the pulp if I was going to make it like an actual sculpture like this. But then through experimentation and messing with other things, I found out that it holds its shape very well just on its own. So this is kind of what it evolved into. This is a work in progress piece of a piece that I made for In Other Miles, which is an exhibition that I did as a resident in public functionary in 2023. And I think this was the first piece where, well, let me talk about the process first. This is, I had my storage bin and you can see the lid under there. And I was pouring pulp onto the decal and then using my palette knife and my fingers to kind of rip little holes in it. And then do some of these <laughs> and then shape the little holes. So I don't know, I think that was really like a, um, an evolution of the sculpting process, process and it turned into this, which I think is, but it's the largest paper piece that I've made. And I think it's also the most conceptual and cer cerebral quote unquote, because up until this point, I was just like messing around. I was like, what can paper pulp do? What are the limits? What's what kind of stuff can I use to make paper? But with this one, I was responding to the prompt of like rhythm and repetition and syncopation. That was the theme of the show of In Other Miles. And it became kind of about like identity and like making something whole out of incomplete pieces. And I also really like the juxtaposition of paper and textile, because I feel like those are two arts that are really central to the evolution of people and people's history. Um, so I, I'm really into the juxtaposition of that. These little bits here, uh, the paper is fragile, surprise. So it broke a lot while I was trying to like move it very carefully in my studio. So I ended up kind of using embroidery floss and kind of weaving it onto itself to try to fill those gaps. And that's kind of where it became this practice of making something whole. And then the black is the stuff that you lay down under mulch before you set mulch. I can't remember what it's called. But I thought it would be nice, a nice substitute to window screen. And it turns out it doesn't let water through at all. So it is not a good substitute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this, I made this out of grass clippings that I found at Lake of the Isles. So this is, it's not, I'm jumping out of the chronological order now. But I did want to show that I'm also playing with materials. And sorry to the people on Zoom, but I did bring a big portfolio, not a big portfolio, but it's that more example of some of the pieces that I've made. And I think maybe I'll like throw this up in the back so that maybe on your way out you can do a little flip through. But I'll try to do a quick verbal explanation of what I got in here. But this is from the first batch. It's got the newspaper and the construction paper. And then this is the Lake of the Isles, just the grass. At this point, I didn't know that you should boil it to help the fibers break apart. And so I just put wet grass in the blender. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this will work. And then it came out just straight up grass. And I was like, okay, we'll try to work with this and see if it still holds together. And it did for the most part. It's kind of falling apart a little bit. But it was like a sheet, a very delicate sheet of paper. And I was like, okay, that makes paper. Maybe she needs some supporting cast. So I put some regular paper pulp in with the grass. And you can kind of see the textures there, which I think were very fun. And I think it's also really fun how the materials that you use kind of make the piece. Like this is a very 
Minneapolis piece. Like people who are, I think I have some friends from Richmond who are watching who don't know what Lake of the Isles is. I think everybody in Minneapolis knows what Lake of the Isles is. It's where people go and walk around and ogle all of the rich people's houses. Let's <laughs> see, I made this out of junk mail. I had blue and yellow office documents that I blended together. And I was like, will it make green? Like, you know, blue and yellow makes green, but will it work the same way with a paper pulp? It does. And then you can see the little flex of the blue and yellow documents in there, which I think looks interesting. This is yellow office documents. And then this is junk mail and brown paper craft bags with pressed lilacs and some moss sleeves in there, which I think is also, I, I'm interested in how the materials form the identity of a sheet paper, if that makes sense. So that is where, excuse me, where I've been going with the paper making. Keeping that in mind, I'm going to kind of change gears a little bit. I'm gonna talk about people watching and sketching, which is kind of like a new angle that I'm trying to bring into this project. So in my sketching, I think for me, it's like a way to engage with the people in the spaces that are around me in a way that is very comfortable to me. I don't know if it's like a social anxiety thing, but I think I'm more comfortable sometimes just sitting and observing than I am like throwing myself in there. So in doing that, I kind of, like I can remember being at this trombone recital vivid, vividly because I took these sketches and I really like the field journal line of these, the notes about how this guy was staring down the pianist, waiting for his signal to turn the page. <laughs> and I think that relationship between them is very nice. And then this little flick of his wrist, I remember very specifically that his little pianist elegant flick of the wrist that he would do every time he lifted his hand. And this tuba player was really, he was like almost caressing the tuba as he was playing, which I don't know if that's how tuba players generally play. But I thought that was a fun quirk that, that I, I wanted to record. Let's see. And then here, I was at my sister's basketball game at UBC in 2019. And I think I kind of wanted to show this to kind of show the iteration I, that kind of, I use iteration in my practice a lot to kind of pin down what I want it to look like. And then I extend the time and then get, it gets bigger. It's not really exactly what I want it to be, but that might just be because I'm very self-critical. I think a lot of artists are. And so I think doing iterations like that help me let go of perfection and be like, well, this one doesn't have to be perfect. I could just do it again if I need to. And I think with this piece, I really wanted to talk about this guy here because I feel like it's kind of... It feels central to how I sketch because he was admiring the ocean and I was admiring him admiring the ocean. And I think that's kind of what sketching is. It's kind of like, it is a bit of admiration for like little individual quirks that maybe you can relate to or that you just find interesting. And I think that that is kind of the reason why I like to sit down and sketch. It's kind of creating connection with strangers in a way that is, I don't know in what way exactly, but it's comfortable to me and it's unobtrusive. And I don't know, it's kind of like, you get a little tenderness, people are nice, you know what I mean? So it's like falling in love, I suppose, with like these little glimmers and in individuals. Um, and then this is just, I do this a lot, so not, as much as I want to, but this is my dad, and this is my sister, and this is my other sister. And I'm not picturing our my other sister and then my mother. <laughs> so shout out to them. I do still love you. I'm gonna draw you on this page. Um, I want to talk about these little silhouettes I thought were really interesting and in how you capture it's not a portrait, it's like capturing a vibe. You know what I mean? I think that's the difference in sketches and portraits to me. In a portrait, I feel pressured to capture a likeness in a sketch. It's about the gesture and like the character of a person. It's it's the vibe. And that's why I sketch. And that's what I like about people. Um, these are some people who are in the library. I really like the little notes that I write, I think are very fun 
for me, like from a personal sense, because then it helps me. I like I I know what I was thinking. Like this this little one said everybody keeps moving, and then there's a little angry face because I was so mad that I couldn't finish any of these. But then these become almost like micro portraits. You know, you capture like teeny tiny pieces of people. And I wanted to do this to show how these are not drawn from any reference. So how the sketches kind of form in my head and get exaggerated. I like to kind of push gesture and to like the to kind of like the the edge of believability because it looks like if somebody was very flexible they could do this but like looking at him it doesn't look quite right you know what I mean <laughs> like he's got to be crazy flexible in the, the proportions I think this is really interesting this feels like somebody that I know like I don't want to name names but I think it looks like her even though obviously that's not what she looks like and then also in like the expression, I draw a lot of fetal positions. I don't know what that's about. I probably should talk to a therapist about it, but that's okay. And then these are two portraits of me that I wanted to talk about. So this is, I drew this from a picture and that picture there are like little iterations where I was trying to figure out how to draw somebody looking up because this little area of the chin is really hard to draw. And then this is kind of like, a character that I drew based off of myself, not based off of any like physical observation that I was seeing. So I thought it was interesting the juxtaposition of this kind of like red, bombast, head on that carefree, and how like self-conscious and like she's kind of like a wilting flower. And I don't know, I don't know what that means psychologically, but I think the observe the difference between the observation and like what gets internalized, I think is also really interesting. And these are just more recent sketches that I wanted to show off. I did these probably within the last year or two. So my considerations moving forward, marrying the, the paper making and the sketching, I feel like using the different materials and methods of paper making would lend very well to capturing the different characteristics and quirks that different people have. And I would like to use that based off of observational drawings. So this is very self-indulgent because I get to sit around and draw people and then also play with different materials and paper pulp. So I'm really happy that I found some way to kind of indulge myself in that. I want to do a lot of iterations and maybe use those iterations to inform some larger pieces that I can display for the exhibition. But for me, it is about the iteration of it. And I think I want to maybe explore the idea of marketability, mobility, and weatherability in both paper and people. Maybe make a juxtaposition for that. I don't know. It's still a little up in the air. I'm just really nailing down what I want to do still. And I think I want this to end up being a celebration of the diversity and potential of both paper as a material, as opposed to as a canvas for other works, and then but also of people. And I think that's my last slide. Oh no no no. So during the residency, how am I on time? Am I okay? I'm good. So during the residency, I've kind of gotten into paper mache. That's like a very new development or paper clay if, you, if you're on TikTok. So I brought some of those in and I might pass them around too. And I brought in, this is just paper pulp that I put on the deco and like I use some of this until it stands up and it folds its shape together really well. So I don't know if I should pass that around or if it should just put that on the back so that people can have a look, see, because I think that's something that I would like to in my exhibit. I think paper is so tactile. And I think if my work is about connecting with people, I would like people to be able to connect to my pieces through touch, but I have to figure out how that's gonna work because paper is fragile and breakable. And I think it would be really tragic if I was like, look at how similar this little creature sculpture is to a person and somebody like destroys it. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Let's see. This is some paper sculpture that I did that became imagery. Let me hold it up to the camera so you can see too. I hope you can see that. It's a little pumpkin. I made a little squirrel. I made some acorns. I was very much on a fall theme. There's a leaf here. And then I think too, something that I want to not forget in my work is the relationship between paper and the frame and the mold that it's in. 
So I think this is a little print that I made. This is a little paper that I built around the print. And it can kind of stand on its own in relationship to that and the frame. It's something that I would like to figure out how to do with people in this project. I don't know how. So I think that would be interesting. I hope that. And I believe that's the last slide. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. Okay. All right. Our next resident who will be speaking is Louise Fisher, who holds an MFA from Arizona State University and a BFA from the University of Northern Iowa. Um, Louise has exhibited both nationally and internationally, and her work has been included in private and public collections. Um, in her work, Louise explores themes of landscape and environmental psychology through prints, artist books, and installations. And Um, we have to go to presenter view, right? Oh, Jennifer's doing that for posting the room. Sorry, both sounds Yep. Do you know how to go to presenter view? Oh. Is that um, yeah. No. no, what if it's slideshow? And then, um, yeah, they, but can they see the whole? Oh, wait, no, yeah, actually, they shouldn't be able to. Great, okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So get get cozy with your donut. Um, <laughs> I am going to be reading from a script because I might go off the rails if I don't. You can just ask my students that came that I tend to go over with my lectures. <laughs> anyway, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. And um, the first half of my talk, I'm going to talk about some past work that I've made um, over the past five years. And then after that, I'll be discussing some in-progress work for my Jerome exhibition. I kind of have three main projects that I'm going to do. And throughout the talk, I'm going to try to demonstrate how the past and current work is connected and evolving um, both visually and conceptually. So first, a little background up about me. Um, I'm an artist and I also teach here in the Twin Cities. Um, originally, I'm from rural Iowa. I got my BFA from printmaking at the University of Northern Iowa in 2014. And then two years later, I moved to Phoenix to get my MFA at Arizona State. Um, so once I graduated, I moved back home to the Midwest and ended up here in Minnesota, and I love it. My experience in Arizona was really formative to the work I make today. Um, on the left, I have an image um, of the letterpress studio at ASU. So they have like a separate room for all their printmaking mediums, which is really cool. And according to them, they have the largest type collection on the continent. So it's, um, there's a lot of stuff in there. And uh, under the mentorship of uh, the faculty and staff there, like Professor Heather Green and Dan Mayer of Pyrocantha Press, I really grew a love for bookmaking and letterpress printing, and I really hadn't done it before, um, which eventually led me here to become a Jerome Fellow at MCBA. I mostly am a printmaker and I do a lot of digital media, but my time at ASU really helped me branch out in the making zines and artist books and letterpress prints. 
the most important thing that really ties my work together um, conceptually throughout the years has been place and landscape. Um, it's taken me a while to realize that, um, especially the landscape I grew up in, which is the tall grass prairie in Iowa. So the image on the left is an aerial view of um, where I grew up. And then the image on the right is sort of a zoomed out view of my childhood farmhouse. Um, when I was a kid, it seemed like I had so much access to like a really big sky and the land and it spent a lot of time exploring outside. Um, being a rural kid, this was kind of my source of entertainment and making art about the landscape was really the way I processed the world. Um, I'm really sensitive to how the surrounding, my surroundings look and sound because of this rural upbringing. And this is sort of the inner landscape I take with me everywhere I go. Uh, because of this attention to surroundings, I'm really interested in the way visual cues like light, color, shape, and space affect the way I feel um, or the way that people feel and behave, whether it's the natural landscape or if it's in a more architectural built environment. And there's actually a term for this. It's called environmental psychology, um, which is just how a, a human surroundings affects them psychologically. So for example, like an open view of the sky can make you feel a sense of spaciousness or awe or the way that if you have an office without a window, you kind of feel groggy while you're working because of that lack of natural light. My work changed very dramatically when I moved from Iowa, uh, rural Iowa to Phoenix. Um, that was kind of the first time I had more of a context for that inner landscape because I moved somewhere really different, which is what I wanted. So not only was I now in the desert, which had a completely different colors, textures, and sense of light compared to the Midwest, but in Phoenix, I was enveloped by skyscrapers, loud traffic, and a lot of LED lighting at night. And I noticed how that, that noise and light pollution affected my well-being. In addition to that limited view of the sky in an urban area, um, I began researching circadian rhythms and how the urban environment can affect a person's health, behavior, sense of time. Um, so I'm exploring these ideas in works such as the 24 seven interior series. Um, this is from 2019. I can't believe it's already five years old. Um, this is a series of six prints. They're about two by three feet. Um, each one has uh, desert skies and office windows that are kind of combined together. So I composited those photographs I took in Photoshop. I inkjet, inkjet printed them onto Kozo paper um, and actually backlit these, not that you can really tell. <laughs> and then I printed a woodcut um, on top where I like kind of carved out these abstract um, power lines. And um, if you can see the line work through there, those are the carved areas of the wood. Um, and then everything else uh, the, was covered with relief ink um, and a bunch of gradients. And so that ink was um, color matched to the background. And that way I got this really subtle shift in light and color. The source imagery was taken from excursions to the Sonoran Desert and to downtown Phoenix, where commercial buildings left their lights on at night so this was my earliest exploration of natural versus architectural space, color, and light in my work. Okay. Does that look okay in terms of the, is it kind of dark? You could try turning off the lights. Mm -hmm. Here we go. The next piece was made alongside the artwork in the previous slide, so it's also from 2019. This is called The Circadian Project. It's a series of four unique artist books that feature original pinhole photographs and it, um, with digitally printed text on the inside. The, hard co the hard covers um, were wrapped in book cloth and they feature screen printed elements. And then the book is, has Coptic stitch binding. Each of the books um, in the series is a season, so winter, spring, summer, et cetera, of this circadian project. Um, so what I did was I took a photograph while I was sleeping every night in 2018. Um, it became like an eight hour long 
photograph. Um, so I used a pinhole camera, which is just a box with a hole in it. I had like a wooden box and then a shoe box that I used for a long time. And inside I would put light sensitive paper to capture um, long exposures of artificial light. Some of the images were taken in my house and pointed to the window because I had like a lot of light coming in from the street. Other times I left the box in my yard or um, on the street and I brought them camping with me. Um, so some of those ones when I'm camping, it's just like the moon going across the sky. The amount of light in each photograph changed depending on where I was and what time of year it was. Um, and so I, I also cataloged like the, the time of the exposure, the date and location of each photograph. And then there's um, each book has a poem that I wrote inspired by my dream journal from that year. Oh, the screen share is not working. Sorry, guys. Someone in the chat, let me know if that looks better. Okay, great. Okay, there we go. Um, every corner is for sale is uh, from a series of free prints that combines images of skies and downtown comp apartment complexes in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. the, the first layer is digitally printed with woodcut and screen print on top. In these pieces, I'm continuing to think about how light interacts with the inside and outside of architectural spaces. And the title refers to the sky being like the last frontier for sale for humans. Um, for the past five years in my work, I've been deconstructing and dissecting sky imagery with these architectural shapes to convey an idea of a barrier or a threshold um, to the natural world. Um, <clears throat> these two pieces were also made in 2021, like the last series, and feature some of my paper cutting explorations, which is sort of a contingent off of book arts. Um, the piece on the left is from an ongoing project called Portals to Cross. So in this project, I repurpose scraps of misprints and test prints to create new artworks, which sort of serve as sort of like formal studies for larger compositions. Um, this series really helped me discover the architectural potential of paper, which is what I call it. Um, I like to actually build things with paper. So I, it started as just cutting out windows and then layering prints together and see what happened. Um, so this particular collage has three pieces of paper that are adhered together and you can actually see through it. Um, the artwork on the right is called Concrete Regals, It's Angular Ghost. Um, I like to name my artworks after my lines in my poetry because I'm really bad at it otherwise. <laughs> Uh, this is a larger scale version of the paper cut um, exploration. This piece was made by printing inked wood onto large sheets of architectural vellum. And then the windows are cut out with a laser cutter. Um, and it's actually made up of like individual sheets of paper that I then tiled and glued together with PVA glue. Um, in that piece, I recreated the facade of a high rise building in Minneapolis, employing the two dimensional nature of the material to evoke what I call the inherent vulnerability of the built environment. The artwork is at the same time a printed artwork and also a matrix because it's projecting like the light and shadow onto the wall. Um, and I showed this piece at Squirrel House Arts um, in the Longfellow neighborhood. I was a artist in residence that year. A struggle to get this to play. There we go. Okay, so this was my most recent artist book. If I could just get it to play. Oops. When I click, click play, it does nothing. Okay, we got it. I just had to click 10 times, that's all. <laughs> okay, uh, so this book is called The Dream Bank. Um, it's a 
book featuring my own collection of poems inspired by dreams that I've had. Um, so the title refers to this writing technique I like to do where I combine phrases and words from something else, in this case, my dream journal, and I put it together to create like a new um, story. This book was um, funded and supported by a residency for book artists and printmakers at the Grant Center for Arts and Culture in New Ulm. I really recommend it. Um, the cover was screen printed. It has like this abstract image of fire. Um, and then the four poems are printed with handset type. Each poem is accompanied by an illustration that's pressure printed. Um, a few of the illustrations include stained glass window and a possum on fire, because I uh, you know, had a dream about that. The video also demonstrates how the book can be read like a regular codex. It can also be opened um, up, and this is called a circle accordion structure. Everything about the book, like the colors, the circular structure, um, the imagery all conveys an ephemeral dreamlike world where nothing begins or ends. Um, a lot of the themes, I'm, I'm sure you didn't have time to read the poems in a short clip, but I'm thinking a lot about um, climate anxiety and the relationship of human and animals in that one. So now I'm going to start talking about what I'm working on in progress. I've never given a talk on like in progress work before. Um, so I'm kind of shifting from commercial to more domestic architecture. Originally, I was going to make work about the suburbs because um, I live in Apple Valley. But in October, I started house hunting um, as a first time home buyer, and that really captured my interest. Um, so the exhibition centers around a collection of um, over 50 house portraits I found on Zillow that are photoshopped to look like they're taken at sunset time with the lights on in the home. So that's what's in the gift there. It's uh, the edited light is a sales tactic. It's meant to romanticize a property and evoke feelings of comfort and longing. And the, the photographs are like beautiful, but they're also very artificial. And it's just interesting because when you go to look at these places in person, which I often did, it's misleading. It hides a lot of the imperfections. Um, in this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research that's informing my drone project. Um, so every day for the past six months, I've been thinking about the U.S. housing market, which is exhausting, and it's impact on us. <laughs> um, I follow a lot of news on housing, particularly love NPR's Marketplace podcast. I have a screenshot here with one of their headlines, quote, are we finished with starter homes? Um, and if you listen to that, it they say that a brand new starter home in California in 1959, there was one example, it cost, it would have cost $112,000 to build today when adjusted for inflation. But the actual cost right now of a single family home is over $400,000. And um, today you need to make at least $120,000 salary to afford an average single family home but only 20% of Americans earn a six figure salary. Um, so, and then a lot of existing homeowners are kind of stuck in their homes right now. They're experiencing something called the lock-in effect where they can't really like purchase up to a better home because of high inflation and interest rates. So if everyone um, in the country was a first time home buyer right now that about 80% of people could not afford an average home so clearly this access to home ownership is an, at an all time loan because of that, it's really competitive. Um, and a home gives you access to refuge, privacy, more of an ability to control your view and your surroundings. So I wonder how like good housing or lack of it affects us in terms of our health, um, our behavior. Um, and then buying that single family home is like the quintessential American dream that's kind of becoming out of reach for so many people. And that's why I feel like it's an important and relevant topic. Um, I like to read a lot before I get started with a new body of work. I feel like this is a very, I don't know, I feel like it's a really different direction. So I just wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. Um, these two images um, are the front covers of some books I've read, A Field Guide to American Houses, which is like give some context behind the design and history be behind 
common types of American homes, like a ranch style home or a, like a four square. And then I really love this book called Headspace, The Psychology of City Living. Um, Dr. Paul Keedwell is an actual um, environmental uh, psychologist. So he's interested in um, thinking about how architecture can kind of inspire or restore us or how bad design can cause anxiety and depression. Um, so there's chapters on like neighborhoods, urban planning, domestic architecture, uh, architecture in public spaces. And he's um, he often, de he demonstrates that not being able to access privacy in our surroundings and housing and outdoor spaces is a key factor in whether or not we can recover from the stress of work and daily urban life. So things like shared walls um, or shared rooms or limited access to green sprays or trees is strongly co um, correlated with that. Okay, so this isn't much, but um, this is <laughs> the mock-up for my artist book that I'm going to make um, for the exhibition. Um, I do have the title figured out, How to Change Day to Dusk. Um, in this book dummy, I'm trying to figure out how the Zillow images look in sequence and what structure would look good. So this one is a perfect bound book and a perfect book, perfect bound book is basically a stack of paper sheets that are glued along the spine and then they're glued again into a cover. And it's very common for magazines and editorials. So I like how it alludes to the experience of like shopping in a catalog, um, I'm planning to include printed images of the houses alongside lines of my poetry. Um, so the images and phrases in the book are all extracted from Zillow listings and real estate articles. And there's gonna be um, an edition of the books rather than one unique one. All right, so here's what the images should look like. Um, I had to try out several things for the, for the images including hand drawing, but I ultimately like how this looks. Um, so I actually used four different colors in a series of dots and layered them on top of each other. It's called color separating. Um, so on the one hand, um, I didn't wanna just like print out someone's photograph on a copy machine because they're screenshots, they're very pixelated. Um, and that's not very interesting. And then on the other hand, when I tried to draw these by hand, it was like too far removed from the original. But um, the half tone looks like real and unreal, which was that dreamy look I'm going for. Um, so the image on the left is um, samples of some of those house portraits with how and seeing how it looks with my poetry. And then the one on the right is an image of the the close-up of the halftone dots. So you can see that like the further away it is, the more it looks like a normal image. But then when you get up close, you see the dots and you can see that it's sort of like um, slightly shifted in the layering. It looks kind of fuzzy. And I love that. Oops. So maybe some of you have questions about how I printed these. So I'd like to explain that. Um, the image on the left shows you um, how one of those photographs was, how it would look if it were all four separate mm -hmm. layers. Um, obviously they're all printed on top of each other so you don't see the individual colors, but those are the four colors. Cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, well, technically fluorescent pink, but. <laughs> uh, and then the image on the right is a risograph machine, um, which is what I'm, planning to use, but you can do color separations with lots of different printing technology. So a risograph machine is best described as a cross between a copy machine and screen printing because it's stencil based. Um, but rather than hand pulling each print like you would with screen printing, uh, the machine cuts a stencil inside of it um, and it prints out copies of your image for you. Um, it does print just one color at a time. And then, um, yeah, I'm also considering doing some screen printing as well because you can you can do color separations with screen printing. Um, but I, I love the look of the commercial like um, nature of, of um, halftones. Like it's all made up of tiny little dots. Um, 
And this is commonly how things are printed, like brochures and other like commercial printing. So it definitely, again, alludes to that experience of shopping and commercialism. And then this is some of the poetry that I'm working on. My artist books almost always feature some of my creative writing, as you saw in some of the earlier works. Um, <clears throat> for this project, I'm making more poems from found text. So like in the image on the right, this is, I printed out a real estate um, article on <laughs> how, how to uh, apply these Photoshop edits to make your house look romantic. And so I highlighted the words that interested me um, I'm also like taking things from the like descriptions on properties on Zillow, like don't wait, this one won't last long. Um, so I really like how writing poetry in this way, it feels like you're collaging where you're like taking um, cut out pieces of paper and then making a new visual image with it. But just in terms of creative writing. Um, so the lines of the book, or sorry, the lines of the poem will be featured throughout the pages of the book and kind of broken up in the pages. Um, and some of the text will be printed with letterpress. Alongside my artist book, the exhibition will feature some three-dimensional pieces made from printed paper. Um, I'm pretty excited about this. For um, I'm very much a 2D artist and struggle to think dimensionally. Um, however, I've been learning, uh, as I've been learning more about book art over the years, I feel like my hands and my brain are kind of getting it now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm branching out more into 3D stuff. In the past, I've worked with cutting paper, tiling paper, with that um, architectural potential of paper thing in mind, yet it's never really made, I've never made something in the round. Um, so that's um, what I'm trying to do now. And I think this residency has the right amount of support to kind of pushed me into making something more 3D. And I just recently took a, um, a pop-up book workshop, which was really helpful, just figuring out how to fold and glue things. Um, <clears throat> and I really like the idea of trying to make something 3D from a photograph to make it more real and attainable. Um, and this is also, I guess, my way of building more affordable housing. Uh, <laughs> The images um, on these pieces are, again, my own photographs um, of clouds and it's printed on matte photo paper. I'm planning to have several different pieces like this displayed on a light table, um, kind of like you see in the, in the photographs so that it glows from the inside, um, just like the Zillow um, images. And so for these pieces, I'm like making a template out of cardstock, paper, tape, and an X-Acto knife. And then I can um, trace it and then cut it out and fold it from a printed image. Um, the little piece on the left, even though it looks like um, like a miniature house, it's actually a mudroom from a front porch. And then the one on the right is a roof with a dormer window in it. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of interested in like little architectural details. And then I think I'll make some that are actually full 3D models of house um and that cloud imagery and the lighting um is symbolizing the like this longing for the american dream um lastly i'm making a series of three prints that will be displayed on the wall um so these pieces are featuring drawings of residential lot lines found in aerial maps one rural one suburban and one urban um, for this series, I'm using a map of rural Scott County, um, so like Prior Lake area, a map of the suburbs in Apple Valley, which is where I live, and then a map of um, the uptown neighborhood in Minneapolis. And what I'm interested in in doing that is how the lot lines make different shapes based on where you live. And I just wonder how that affects um, the people that live there. So urban lots are really rigid and uniform and narrow and they're arranged in like blocks, like rectangular blocks. And then this, in this drawing, it's actually the suburbs. So they're pretty uniform, but they're arranged in curves because there's cul-de-sacs. And then the rural lots are like really large, but they vary in size. So they feel kind of more natural, I guess. 
Um, and I'm thinking about how urban design affects the residents. I'm thinking about land ownership and how that's part of this American dream. Um, so again, here I'm using my sky photography to allude to that and the access to space. Um, the drawing of the lot line map is a mock-up for another layer that I might do on the print, or it could also be like two pieces of paper on, on top of one another like this, but I, I'm having fun kind of filling in some of the shapes so that you can't see through them and then cutting out other ones. Um, just so like there's selective parts of the sky that you can or can't see. So again, just saying something about um, access to nature, how much of it do we see or not see. Um, okay, so thank you everybody for being here and for listening to our talks this evening. Um, I also want to thank the Jerome Foundation because this has been a great and supportive opportunity and my colleagues um, in the front row and everyone that works at MCBA have had a good time so far. Um, if you want to keep updates on the project, you can um, follow me on Instagram. The QR code is to my Instagram page and then my website's there. That's it. Thank you so much. It doesn't matter because let's just Okay, finally, um, next, last but not least, we're going to hear from Christopher Selleck. Christopher was born in Augusta, Georgia. He received his BFA in photography from the University of Minnesota and his MFA in visual studies and photography from Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Using sports and masculinity as a lens to view identity, his various projects in the last few years have focused on this area of identity construction. All right, welcome, Christopher. Hi, thanks so much. Um, for everyone for attending. And um, like Louise, I would also like to thank um, the Jerome Foundation. Um, being recognized in this specific field is, is really quite an honor. Um, and I have been sort of toiling and working here um, at MCBA sort of in the background as I'm working on other projects. Um, so I'm incredibly indebted to the folks at MCBA who've um, provided facilities, support, material, um, access to um, research and learning that I, I mean, I can't find online or at libraries. Um, the library here has just been a really great resource. Um, as um, Annika said, I'm an artist and educator based in Minneapolis. Um, she sort of grabbed my my lead in. Um, I've been using sports and masculinity um, as a way to talk about um, identity construction, really pulling from my own experiences of growing up as um, a queer closeted teen in the 80s and 90s, and that experience of sort of discovering who I was as um, a queer person and an artist during that time was fairly fraught um, and sort of this sense of discovery um, throughout sort of my development as a queer person and as an artist. Um, I think photography has been the basis of my 
practice, um, specifically um, portraiture and self-portraiture. This is an exhibit or an installation shot from my most recent exhibit um, regionally um, at Minneapolis Institute of Arts in conjunction with the MAEP um, program. Um, my biggest um, sort of accomplishment to date and was really sort of has been a highlight of my artistic career. Um, it was really sort of great in putting together this project um, and presentation to sort of start in a more recent place and sort of go back and forth in time. Um, when I look at this, I can, I can see the development um, of myself as a photographer, but sort of opening myself up to be an artist who uses photography, but then to be open to utilizing um, video to think about installation, and of course, uh, print paper book, which has been a very sort of um, wonderful part of my process. Um, this is sort of the outer room, which was uh, a very sort of personal space to walk into. Ooh, sorry. Um, that sort of set the tone. You uh, moved through into this large space that was filled with portraits in ranges of sizes. Um, all um, folks who identified as men who were um, in some way attributing bodybuilding as um, some facet of their identity sort of mixed in there as another self-portrait of myself. Um, the basis for a lot of my work actually has been something I've been um, investigating since um, working with uh, Paul Shambroom at the University of Minnesota. Um, he was an unofficial mentor to me while I was at the U and was really somebody who was very pushy with me about pushing me to do more. Like the first person to ever have looked at my metadata and been like, um, you were only at this location for this long. Like you need to be there twice as long. I was like, oh, you you read my metadata. I was like, okay. Um, and in that sort of um, space, um, I developed this first project that I um, called um, Sports Complex um, Protection. Um, I often think of this as um, Cindy Sherman meets ESPN, um, but it was a studio self-portrait project utilizing props that I would purchase. Um, and you can't quite see, but it would be like props and equipment um, that would be sort of protective gear um, kind of hiding the tags because a lot of these things I would sort of buy and then return. Um, in creating these uh, self-portraits, utilizing um, lighting, um, parts of the costume, the, the position of the lighting. Oops, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Let's just stop. Let me show. This one's like so I was at a talk at MCAB like during my MFA and there was somebody visiting who for whatever reason the projector kept starting and stopping. Like I cannot remember, he's a colleague of Catherine Gershon's. I could not remember this artist's name, but the slides would start and then they would stop. And this artist was just so calm and collected. He was just like, okay, like, here we go. Um, and I just remember watching that and just being like, I mean, I, we were, I was sharing with Louise sort of earlier, um, this like, oh, public speaking, it's like dread. And it's like, as educators, like, I mean, I spent three hours sort of off the cuff just talking with students about portraiture and photography to then sort of come here. It's like talking about myself seems okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, we see it now. I think we just had to restart it for some reason. All right. Okay. Continue. Sorry for it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so yeah, this was um, a self-portrait project. When I look at this, I can see what I really wanted to do was to sort of connect with other um, athletes or um, men who sort of participated in some of these sports who use sports as maybe a way to sort of um, be an overarching um, part of their identity. But I, in seeing these self-portraits, I can also sort of recognize this apprehension and sort of fear in my own self of wanting to sort of engage like that and really utilizing myself as a model as a way to sort of hone my craft of um, portraiture and photography and sort of develop confidence in my abilities and in sort of my own sort of identity and sort of personhood. Um, this was really uh, pivotal for me. Um, this project um, paid, I got a scholarship that sort of paid for half of my senior year based on this work and really has been this space that I've sort of been able to grow from, the sort of impetus coming from this um, encounter or a recollection of an encounter when I was a small boy being bullied by neighborhood kids and coming home and my dad being like, why are you here? Like, go out and be a man. And mm -hmm. that idea of um, what happened is less important, but just sort of that memory of that, um, that comment being like something that I, I should know. And that um, a lot of my work has really been this um, exploration of sort of that terrain of masculinity that in the way I sort of do research and think about work often just leads to more questions, which I'm okay with. Um, and I mean, I'm coming to resolutions and sort of different um, places with the work. But yeah, for me, questions just lead to different investigations. Um, in starting my MFA program, I was really sort of interested in trying to isolate places and locations that uh, had, I guess I had a list of types of hypermasculine ideals that I thought men sort of as like ascribed to. Um, and I'd made this list thinking like it was 20 some items that I would just in a shot list sort of way do two or three of these um, sort of discrete portraits and sort of have a project. Um, but really it, it became like I started, oops. Now I can't move the slides. Oh, I'm doing my other thing. Um, space bar, no. Enter. Siri, next slide. No notes. Uh, Is this a touch screen? So in between my MFA uh, or my BFA and my MFA, oh, there we go. I, um, I, I had compiled that list um, and fighters was one of those things on there. Um, initially I wanted it to be, or I had thought I wanted to have it be documentary, more fly on the wall. And in sort of seeing that, um, I can see that sort of that um, looking back and thinking about um, my self-portrait. Um, I had a mentor at the time, Catherine Torshan, who was a lot familiar with my self-portrait work and was like, hey, you should make formal portraits with these fighters. And I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> like, talk to those guys. Um, and she's like, yeah, I think you should. I was like, mm, I don't know. Um, but... I did, and sort of uh, the first uh, fighter, the uh, model on the, the left, uh, Byron, um, 
when I asked him, like, hey, could I take your picture? He was like, yeah, um, which helped. Um, I made a series of images of these fighters um, in the gym space. It might be sort of hard to see on these projections, um, but in the background, there are sort of just little subtle details about the gym space. There's two sort of heavy bags behind this other model, um, Nick the Natural, who um, was really sort of amazing to work with. And this image was something that um, I was able, inside of my grad school experience, to sort of show at other locations around the state, out of the state, um, and really sort of help um, move this project forward. Um, I think one of the great things about um, my interdisciplinary sort of <laughs> space at MCAD was that there was a lot of uh, wiggle room to sort of explore in other areas. And I can sort of start to see at this moment, oops, we jumped a slide. Oh, two slides. Uh, sort of my work starting to get, I would say like weird in a different way. Um, thinking about um, using uh, a screen as a metaphor for um, perhaps the television or a protective barrier. Um, there's sort of a reference in this um, essay about titled Cartography of Desire where talking about sort of that surface really makes sort of this space where if we're thinking about um, what's behind the screen, a nude or near nude body or a male body specifically, that the screen sort of makes this other thing that folks can engage with. Um, and um, making these pieces more sort of universal, this series is called Male Veils to sort of um, make them more, um, universal and ambiguous, where um, I'm inserted in some of these in that sense that with this, this is actually, and I guess I've never fully acknowledged this, but this is a self-portrait. Um, when I talk about this as a male veil portrait and not as a self-portrait, people sort of engage with it differently. Um, male veil number four, this is not me. Um, uh, also sort of really push that, um, sort of incorporating some of that elements of um, desire and eroticism um, sort of allowed me to sort of be thinking more conceptually and re sort of imagining things that I had encountered and remembered growing up. Um, photographing the TV um, as a, a way to sort of recollect um, things that had been sort of living sort of uncategorized in my brain, I guess, for a way. Um, and again, starting to get just more weird. Um, I just remember showing this for the first time. Um, this is a jersey that I had acquired at a thrift shop with the term Old Glory or um, text Old Glory sort of um, buried in it under glassine and acrylic, or, um, epoxy resin, sorry. Um, and then positioned on the wall to sort of reference a glory hole. And it felt very, um, very powerful for me to sort of um, exhibit this for the first time and to sort of exhibit work that was non-photographic as well in a different way. Um, in sort of that, it comes back to photo, a very technical term for a, a glory hole has uh, it sort of listed as an aperture which I thought was sort of funny. Um, utilizing text and material, um, I think the screen sort of, the screen and the mesh um, sort of function in different ways. Um, this is obviously part of a sports jersey. Um, that mesh is meant to sort of, in my opinion, emulate uh, like uh, battle armor or sort of that undercoat of chain mail. Um, but when you look at it, it's really just thin pieces of string and it's almost like delicate athletic lace. So there's sort of a tenderness and a beauty to it. Um, in sort of uh, 
reliving and sort of remembering aspects of my past, sort of um, reading an essay by Chad States where he talked about um, his own coming of age, sort of understanding sexuality as who he was as a gay man or queer person through the pages of eroticized fiction, um, which um, this one sort of specifically referencing Jack Tales, sort of a, a, a tongue, you know, a pun, obviously, um, and sort of utilizing what I call um, parafiction, where the stories would be we're two red-blooded guys, but we're in the locker room and our knees touch and all of a sudden we're going at it. And you're like, wait, what? But then pulling it back, the parafiction aspect being like, but we know we really should be with women. And there's always this sort of like um, place of making those encounters non-normative and needing to be hidden in the same way that uh, 16 year old, me may have hidden something like this. Um, and that that in and of itself was sort of something that was interesting, this idea that um, I needed to sort of hide those aspects of my own identity in that same way. Um, this sort of became the basis for a project, um, one of my first book projects, actually. Um, I created a... Um, cover out of epoxy mesh. Um, the book interior is hand sewn in and the belly band is actually a jock strap with uh, uh, stenciled text to sort of uh, incorporate that. Um, the size and shape definitely meant to sort of um, uh, reference the previous slide. Um, In sort of moving forward with a lot of this stuff, um, I have to acknowledge um, wanting, sort of having ideas and understandings for things I wanted to do, but not fully knowing how to express that. Um, and like, if you don't know what something is, you just can't look look it up. Um, so I'm internally, you know, internally debted to um, other bookmakers and printmakers. Um, one in particular, um, Christopher Alde, who was at MCAD while I was getting my MFA, who um, helped me sort of develop this print project um, utilizing uh, jock straps that were at the time varnished to these um, masonite boards. MCAD does this self portrait project, so they'd have these piles of masonite board. I was like, oh, material. So I started like varnishing compulsively not knowing why, like varnishing, epoxying, sort of preserving things. And I had this idea for doing this, but I didn't know what it was. And in sort of my conversations with Chris Frawley, he's like, oh, that's a choreograph or a blind boss. And I was like, oh my God, like there's a name for it. <laughs> um, so that was really helpful um, to sort of be shepherded in by Christopher, who I'm still very close with um, and just have a huge spot in my heart for him and other printmakers along the way who've sort of helped me. Initially, um, I was um, inking these and sending them through sort of an intaglio press onto Reeves. Um, but in sort of developing this, um, really discovered that I could just put the objects sort of on the print bed um, using Reeves again, giving that sort of lush impression um, and sort of that um, mark that may have happened from sort of the wear wearing um, a jock strap, um, but also sort of connecting to this um, fetishized way um, that the jock strap as sort of a symbol or an object or jocks and socks could sort of be. Um, yeah, utilized. Um, in sort of thinking about those hidden desires, my next sort of um, screws. I'm letting somebody in. Uh, my next um, project was utilizing, oops, I let somebody in and now I can't move the slides again. Okay. Uh, utilizing uh, polymer photogravure 
um, to document sort of these inscribed um, messages um, in the bathrooms of uh, the U of M sort of stall walls where men at the time would sort of go to sort of hook up and connect. You would see sort of these notes, some from years back, um, but some from recent years um, using the um, polymer gravure process to sort of replicate um, rubbings. Like I actually tried to do rubbings and I just couldn't get um, the contrast right. Um, but uh, yeah, utilizing this in conjunction with research at the Treader Collection, um, which is a queer archive at the U of M, um, where in their collections would be like 200 yards away from where this image was made, would be a guide saying, hey, go to Anderson Hall, um, basement bathroom on the right. Um, there would be these sort of cruising guides um, and sort of amplifying that tension of connection, um, documenting sort of parts of the scene as well, and then starting to put these things all together in more large room size installations. Um, those are some of the um, polymer gravures on the right. This is actually a key as photographed in the Treader collection from a bathhouse in the 80s where I think fine line was, if not where the fine line was across the street from the fine line. Um, again, a, uh, a faux urinal um, that's hand polished aluminum that I had fabricated, but hand polished myself on um, tile board to sort of recreate the space without having to sort of um, make the whole thing a space. Um, and just continuing to develop that um, here's sort of a combination um, screen printed um, mesh on top of uh, hand polished aluminum. Um, and really a, a strategy that I've used throughout a lot of my career is been uh, working on one project or one sort of vein of thought for a while. And then when I hit a roadblock or sort of come to a point to stop and put that back. Um, the thing that I do always come back to um, in my own personal work and this sort of connects back to the project that we saw at the beginning, my Mia show is portraiture. Um, my most recent project at Mia was photographs of um, bodybuilders. In sort of seeing this work, I can sort of recognize and see my own um, confidence as an artist, as a photographer, um, as a queer person, um, engaging with um, subjects of all kinds um, in a very sort of intimate way to create these images almost collaboratively. Um, the models would come from open calls. They would almost self-selecting, they would reach out to me um, and I would sort of uh, utilize my studio space um, to create these portraits, um, the models sort of looking back as a reference to you looking at them. Um, sort of moving through um, different postures and flexing, um, different levels. Um, with a lot of the models, there would often be um, this hesitation or like, oh, I look at myself and this isn't quite right. And I would sort of think about my own sort of bodily discomfort um, and just sort of recognize that even at sort of this like bodybuilder level, like there's still always that one thing. Um, became sort of a, uh, I think on the surface, on what subver subversive way to be talking about masculinity but then to be talking about sexuality and gender, um, age, bodies, um, varying uh, postures and expressions, um, utilizing the draped materials um, as a reference to painting, um, the soft lighting also sort of amplifying that. Um, and then in sort of a very um, specific way, 
reincorporating myself back into the work, making my, letting myself be that vulnerable was really a big part of the process. And in applying for MAP, like I had applied 10 times or the 10th time was sort of the thing. The 10th application was the inclusion of more of this very vulnerable self-portrait work where I was very clear to be like, um, this is only work in progress. Like I'm not committing to showing this, but they're like, oh, you got it, but you need to show that. And they, I mean, obviously they're not dictating what you're showing, but they were like, yes, that was like the thing that sort of connected us. Um, I just included um, this uh, self-portrait in sculptural form as um, just sort of this evidence of this evolution as, as myself as an artist and sort of my comfort in sort of displaying and putting this work out there. Um, and then sort of bringing this more in line with my current projects. Um, in the background, I've been sort of self-teaching myself ceramics and bookmaking, which has in a way um, functioned as vessels for the pictures. Um, thinking about them as sort of unbound books, um, thinking about the sculptural items being displayed with them. This is from an exhibit here at MCBA a few years ago, but then getting to explore with the book form. Um, I have been sort of photographing models with a lot of different projects and ideas in mind. And this is one that finally came to fruition. Um, it's an accordion book with a blue velvet cover where we see sort of a flex sequence of this model um, sort of going into sort of this apex of a form, but then sort of retreating, um, sort of recognizing that that flexed pose that he's in at the apex is not something that he could hold indefinitely and that there's sort of a, a fleetingness to it. Um, the book form itself flexes and moves. Um, and it's it's been just a really great way to sort of um, be working into the book form. Um, a lot of this stuff I've been self-teaching myself, but getting a lot of insight and feedback on. Um, as I'm moving into my um, Jerome project, this is another aspect that I've been thinking about, this idea of um, sort of hiding and revealing, um, thinking about book forms that do that, maybe creating some book forms that actually have like trap doors or hidden pockets, um, and thinking about what that kind of content is. Um, part of the experience with this um, fellowship that's been so invaluable has been um, uh, just the feedback and conversation um, where like a thought that sort of came up with this was like, oh, it is sort of revealing. There's almost sort of a, a pulling back that's sort of happening. Um, so getting to have these really great um, discussions and encounters with people who can help me sort of verbalize these ideas that have been just sort of living in my head. Um, the second aspect of sort of work in progress um, is having seen this in 2000, I had to look this up. This has been something that's been living in my head since like 2013. I saw this at Mia as part of um, a 3D multiples show. It was really sort of, um, I think referencing um, Duchamp's, and this is gonna be terrible, what on Belize, um, my French is terrible, sorry. Um, but sort of a uh, box in a suitcase. Um, this form, when I saw this in the gallery, like I went back and saw this two or three times. This is Tom Rose, who's a professor, now retired from the U, in collaboration with several people, including folks that I've discovered somewhat recently that were collaborated here at MCBA. Um, the project, Arthur and Barbara, is really sort of about this couple and their space together um, in their apartment on Riverside Drive, objects, a camera, a CD, um, a book. Um, and, and just thinking about this project, like 
I applied to MCBA Collegiate Award with a different variation of this. Um, but um, since then, um, I've been sort of working with a collaborator, um, Aaron Morali, who's been super helpful in helping me create bigger forms that my own skill set doesn't fully allow me to do, which um, has been really sort of the great um, thing that I'm sort of getting to do here. Um, what I'm hoping to do is create more objects like this as part of my installation. Um, here for the exhibition this fall, um, incorporating objects, my sculptural works. Um, the working title for this is Unbroken. Um, it's uh, three trays. A middle tier that's not pictured would have sort of a different accordion book that's still sort of in process. Um, but working with her, um, Aaron Raleigh to sort of fabricate this has been um, really amazing and helping me sort of develop um, a language and an understanding that I didn't previously have with um, book arts. Um, in just even little encounters where it's like, oh, do you want this kind of a thing or that? And I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that was a question. Like, let's talk about it. Um, so being able to develop that understanding of very specific forms and how different choices, I mean, really will um, in the end sort of uh, hopefully culminate with beautiful objects like this that again will sort of be revealed. Um, yeah, that's my last slide. Maybe all three of you come up for questions, and then if you are answering one, just step up. Um, but if you are on Zoom, please put questions in the chat. And does anyone in person have any questions for any of our residents? And just so you all know that they mentioned, their exhibition will be opening in November of this year. So please come back for that to see these projects finished. Plenty of time. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I, I knew one of the people. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which model? It was, um, he, he was like in the sky, um, he had a big tattoo on his chest. He was uh, a showy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Joey, Joey Gaines with a Z. Gaines, yeah. Um, one of the great experiences was getting to actually share the gallery space with a lot of those models, and that uh, model actually showed up sort of on one of the last days. And I was in the gallery by myself, and I turned around, and he walked in, and he was like, "I mean, he had continued to sort of um, continue developing sort of bodybuilding look completely different." It was like really sort of a great experience with many of these models to have them sort of reach out um, and connect back. Probably a lot of cis men too. I feel like I don't know a lot of straights. They're okay. Um, they're okay people. Um, and I think that's sort of an interesting thing that we sort of attribute that to that sort of, um, um, I don't want to say profession or occupation, because um, many of these folks are sort of queer identifying, um, which is sort of interesting that there's sort of a back and forth there where um, that was sort of a common question or reaction that I was getting. But it was like, well, actually, but yeah, no. Yeah, that was definitely a negotiation and sort of a conversation that was really weird up front with just photographing some of the models where it's like this almost hesitation when, because my ask is kind of terrible. I'd be like, oh my God, like you look amazing. Oh, and they're just like, dude, back up. Um, <laughs> this sort of recognition where it's like, ooh, that sounds really weird. And it's like, um, have you seen your Instagram? Like you've turned your underwear into a thong and you're putting that on Instagram. Like, that's gay? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's okay. 
Sorry, I keep moving in and out. Uh, how is your level of vulnerability different when you're approaching your self-portrait in like different forms of self Or is there a difference? I mean, there, I mean, it is, there's sort of an ambiguity that it, I think sort of in the other forms like that sculptural piece, it's it feels a lot different than when I look at that um, photograph of me holding the plate, sort of intentionally covering parts of my body. Um, yeah, I mean, there feel it. There's sort of a comfort there that exists, but also sort of a hesitation in sort of venturing into other, like I often say, like other people's spaces. Like I'm not a sculptor, and I, you know, but I make sculptures in the same way where it's like I don't think of myself as a printmaker, but I make a lot of print work. Yeah, not, I don't know if it's like really or not. It's not really for anyone specific, but like, I struggle a lot with like really coming up with ideas for really abstract art. How do you, I noticed that like, one of the things that I found was that, like, a lot of your art was, like, really more, like, abstract or metaphorical. Not a lot of it was, like, super, there was, like, obviously there was some that was, like, representational, but not mm -hmm. a lot of it was, like, super representational. How do you, like, what's your thought process for coming up with that kind of art? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm curious. First, um, I think I think I you out <laughs> because most of my artwork is very representational. I think my paperwork is very abstract because I'm exploring a material as opposed to like draw because drawing is where yeah. that that's my roots, you know. So I think I think I talked about this with you guys too. It's abstract because I'm focusing more on the material than I am on what happens, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I think the one piece that was kind of a response to, like in other miles, the big piece that was kind of like lashed together. I think I make a piece first and then the meaning comes afterward. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's generally, if I make something that's cerebral, quote unquote, that's <laughs> I think that's, that's how it works for me. All right. Um... I think with me, I try to, I'm trying to pay attention to small details and things. Um, so it's kind of like the zoomed in focus and oftentimes that um, lends itself to abstraction. And I think it's different for every artist, but I really like combining things in new ways that sort of become abstract. So like the poetry, the digital compositing, um, and I'm also talking about a lot of abstract things like color and light. So that just lends itself to it. Um, but yeah, I just, and I, I also draw um, and I have to have something in front of me. I'm very observational. So I struggle to like make things from my imagination. I just, I'm not one of those artists. I'm just picking little things from my environment and recombining them in new ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think even just in thinking about all of our work, like in just what we presented tonight, there's a lot of exploration where, I mean, my studio is half full of failed experiments. And I can imagine like not every time you pick up paper or a pencil or whatever that it's success where mm -hmm. it's like, oh man, I spent three hours and this is hot trash. You know, <laughs> and it's just like, I'll just put that aside because as soon as I throw it away, then I'll be like, oh, where's that blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh, I threw it away. So I have sort of this like order, <laughs> regret sort of process as part of that, I guess, but just keep trying and keep, yeah, yeah. imagining things. And like Christopher is also thinking about the symbolism of materials and objects too. And that looks really nice alongside the more representational portraits. Uh, anything in the chat? Nope. Um, 
Thanks for joining us on Zoom, everyone. I think everyone else, if you have any other questions or comments, we can talk a little bit now um, after the official talk and please grab donuts or a seltzer. <laughs> and, and then also don't forget uh, Jelani's um, looking at your paperwork and flipping through the portfolio. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right, Zoom people. <laughs>